back to uh, the q and I hope you've all had a chance to watch the film now. Uh, I hope my voice now isn't interrupting somebody watching the film. You're listening to me, I'm Michael. I'm the director and co-founder of the Basic Income Conversation. Um, as Salma says in the chat box, I hope people are keeping a track of that. There's so much to unpack. Uh, we've got the next 45 minutes to begin doing that if we can. Uh, I am now uh, recording this Q&A. Uh, so for those of you that um, would like to watch it back uh, afterwards, um, welcome Sean and Wayne. Uh, we've got you for the Q&A. Uh, we'll come to questions shortly, uh, but first a reminder um, that we're here not just to have watched the, the film and to um, have the Q&A we're about to have, but also for a fundraiser for our work here at the Basic Income Conversation. Uh, thanks to everyone who has donated already. It's been great to see uh, the donations coming through in the last hour. Please keep them coming. I'll put the link in the chat again. We're really grateful for that. Um, we heard a challenge, uh, didn't we, at, towards the end of the film. I think it was from Chris Goulden from JRF. He said, basic income advocates must get to grips with the problem of winning hearts and minds. And I think Guy standing uh, Professor Guy standing in the film reinforced it as well, referencing President Roosevelt sort of using the words, you've convinced me, now you must force me to do it. And that's exactly the work that the Basic Income Conversation is involved in, spreading conversations to win hearts and minds and build, helping to build this powerful uh, network of individuals and organisations that can build the power to compel our decision makers to, to enact a basic income. Uh, and so that's why your contributions are so important tonight. Um, I'll put the link in there again uh, for you to, uh, to make a donation if you are able to. Um, and uh, that would be really, really appreciated. Um, we are uh, the, where are we? So, um, now the time is for questions. Uh, I think the film, as I said earlier, is, is, is a brilliant and kind of balanced uh, overview of the arguments around basic income. I don't know how you, it's such a challenge doing a film about basic income. I think you could do it for you could do a whole series of uh, really in-depth ones. I think they've done a really good job of, of getting to, to some of the main arguments in such a short space of time. Uh, I've, I've got some questions, I know others do as well, as well as Sean and Wayne joining us for the Q&A, uh, who are the directors uh, we also have Barb Jacobson joining us. She's one of the directors of Basic Income UK and is one of the most prominent campaigners for a basic income in the UK, in Europe, and I would probably say, Barb, in, in the world as well. So we've, we're very uh, grateful for, for you joining us uh, this evening. Uh, and you'll, you'll recognise Barb as she was uh, featured in the film herself. And I know you'll, you'll add a lot to, to some of the conversation we're about to have. How this is going to work, I think some of you already have been doing this, which is fantastic. Please put your questions either in the Zoom chat box um, or there's a, there's a Q&A function as well. Um, either of those, I think my colleague Cleo is trying to fish out some of the best questions to pitch to our panel. We're particularly interested in questions about the film itself. I know we're going to, I'm sure we'll talk about basic income generally, but please do think about the film itself and, and questions relating to that. We can't promise to get to them all, but we're going to give it a good go. Um, and uh, while you're thinking of uh, and continuing to put some of those questions in there, I just wanted to kick us off with a question for um, Sean and Wayne, first of all. Um, I was just keen to think, about, I suppose, a feature of the film, aside from the interviews of, of, of the experts and, and people in it, I would say is the edited clips, the, the, how you kind of take us back in time. I thought they really illustrated what John, George Mumbai was saying in terms of something has gone horribly wrong with our politics there. That actually not that long ago, we had a, maybe a different attitude to, to, the, to the state and to welfare generally. I've noticed in one example of it is the commentary of the lady who said, who just 50 years earlier would have been totally reliant on ch charities to fill, uh, feed her children. And then it immediately cut to the food bank, I think, I think was it in Bolton? And um, I just wondered, Sean, and Wayne, was that the intentional role of having the, hit, what was the, hist like the role of having the historic clips uh, as part, as a big part of the film? Uh, and what other role do you think they play in, in, in the film itself? Uh, well, we, we took that style from the future work and death, um, frankly, more for budgetary reasons uh, initially. 
Um, but uh, yeah, it, it kind of serves as a reminder that the, the issue um, was just as relevant then as it is now, only now it's more um, plausible to have these things put in place. Um, like it's, 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 an, it's an ongoing issue for society. And yeah, it, I suppose it also kind of highlights a, t a type of regressivism as well when, you, when it's coupled with you know, the archive footage with the, uh, the modern day footage. It just, it, it, it kind of reinforces the point um, that we're, we're in a bit of a rut. Yeah, it's just, it's kind of a, uh, we're kind of lucky to have that as a fairly easy tool uh, with things like the Prelinger archives available to filmmakers online. Because, you know, using the past to reference the present um, when talking about political issues is usually quite helpful because we tend to easily forget, um, you know, that history tends to repeat itself and we end up in certain cycles politically. Um, so it's uh, it's been a really useful tool for our films, particularly being low budget, uh, to kind of color the film. And, you know, sometimes you can make fun of certain points with the right piece of archive footage. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of watching through archive footage, which isn't the, uh, the easiest thing to do. Uh, many hours spent scanning um, old uh, documentaries and old, um, kind of piece of propaganda, but sometimes you end up with little nuggets and, uh, you know, they make it into the film and, uh, yeah, they really I was, I was, I was going to ask, like, how, where do you find all these clips from, like, for any, like, filmmakers who are interested in this, like, even just very short clips, where, where do you get all of this uh, content from? There's a uh, number of websites, but Prelinger is the, the main one, um, but there's a lot of, um, a lot of sifting you have to do. I think, accumulatively, both of us have watched Hundred films each, like really, like, <laughs> yeah, from the thirties and even earlier. But there's there's a, a couple of, sorry, mate, go on. Okay. I was going to say there's a couple of uh, YouTube channels that show um, that have films that are in the public domain as well. Uh, I think in our first film, The Future of Work and Death, we managed to use Metropolis clips, mm. um, courtesy of channels like that. Thank you. Um, and, and Barb, like kind of a similar question, I guess, like what was, I felt as though part of the film was like the, the kind of the past was haunting us in terms of thinking about the, you know, what, what the situation we face now. You work in, have worked for a long time in welfare uh, rights. What, what's, what's your take on kind of where we sit now with our views of, of the welfare state compared to, to perhaps um, not even that long ago? Well, I think the thing is, I mean, we've seen a huge attack on the welfare state in the last sort of 40 years, really. Um, and there's, you know, while there have been anti-cuts movements, you know, to services and that sort of thing, they've actually not been very, uh, or they've not been powerful enough to get them re reversed, except in very, you know, very small cases. So um, I think what, I think really that what basic income has done or what the discussion of basic income has done is really open out a whole lot of other things that we need to do, um, you know, whether that's the universal basic services discussion, which has come up, or um, you know, whether it's the whole conversation about work and what's that's for, and are we doing, you know, what are we doing or not doing? What the late and great David Graeber said were bullshit jobs, um, and how do we, you know, apportion work? So. Uh, and what do we do with our lives? It also, in my experience talking about it, it also, you know, does bring up lots of questions about the monetary system, taxation, um, you know, the other kinds of things that we, we have yet to really deal with properly in society. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, as Guy Standing says, you know, there was the, the giants that, that were being slain back at, you know, what is it, 70 years ago now. Um, but there were a lot of problems, you know, that, that system assumed full employment of male people and that men could then look after their, their, their wives, you know, without the wives working and all that sort of thing. Um, and I think uh, society has changed quite a lot and the benefit system is really not geared to handle that at all. So, and not even universal credit, so. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I think that's absolutely one of the, the, the features that we see uh, see now, um, the kind of inability for the, for the welfare state to, to keep up with the changing world of work. That seems like a common theme in, in the films. I, you mentioned David Graeber there, Bob. I mm -hmm. think it's a, a, important to, to kind of recognise um, 
his work and, and role in the film. It's, um, for those that don't know, uh, David Graeber uh, sadly passed away at the end of last year. Um, Sean and, and uh, Wayne, what, what was it like being able to, to, to work with him? I think you've interviewed him before, is that right, for some other projects? No, no, that, we, that was the first time we've met him. Yeah, oh. we're really looking forward to it. Um, and uh, it went really well. There's, there's a lot we had to, a lot that was left on the cut room floor, as, as was the case for a lot of interviews. Um, and uh, we were quite keen on doing a, a companion piece to The Cost of Living uh, about uh, bullshit jobs. Um, but no, he was, he, was, he was great, very quotable, man. very quotable. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff, that, especially uh, on bullshit jobs. It's just it, every time we tried to insert it into the cut, it didn't flow from the other subjects as well. And we didn't have as well of a, uh, rounded, a well-rounded, as well of a rounded film as we have now, or we feel we have now. Um, so we decided to maybe use that at a later date. And uh, that's still kind of up in the air, whether or not we do something with that. Yeah, there wasn't an easy decision taking the bullshit yeah. section out. It's just, it, it just didn't flow as well. It really didn't. Um, and and yeah, that makes sense. And Bob, Bob, you you know you know David personally as well. I don't know if you want to just make a kind of tribute to him and then kind of you know just uh, underlie the, the significance of his contributions to to the basic income debate and and, and movement in itself. Yeah. Well. Um... Yeah, I was very privileged to know David uh, for quite a few years before he died. Um, oh gosh, what to say really? I mean, he was a great friend of anybody who was in trouble. And um, I think, you know, in many ways he felt very lucky to be where he was, although he worked very hard to get where he was and really tried to use his, you know, what we're calling privilege now, but, you know, use his resources and, and where he got to, to help as many people as possible. And for him, I, you know, really basic income was, was society's kind of promise to each other that we all look after each other. It wasn't really so much about about an amount of money. It was about people having the freedom to choose what they want to do. And, you know, and for him, you know, have as much freedom as he did to do the things that he, you know, pursue the kinds of things that he wanted to do. Um, certainly, I still miss him for sure. Thanks, Bob. Um, and yeah, we, lots of people do, and um, but I, I'm sure you know, his work's going to live on a long time, not just with basic yeah. income, but, but all sorts of other areas. You, you mentioned Sean and um, when about the uh, you know the, the concept of bullshit jobs, how you were maybe thinking of exploring that further. We've had a bit of discussion in the in the chat about the idea of a of a job guarantee. Um, is that something that you you guys came across in, in your research around the film and what, what, was that explored in, in the other film that you've made or is something something that's of interest to you guys? Uh, no, uh, well, sorry, not the last <laughs> question. No, it, it is anything that's, uh, you know, even a little bit interesting is interesting to us for this uh, this film. Um, no, we, we kind of come across it briefly in the, the future work and death, um, but it, it was also this thing where even that concept will not be a very popular one in say 50 years because basic income perhaps could come about just out of necessity. Um, but a job guarantee, uh, I'm not sure how I, I, I don't know, Wayne, do you wanna? Yeah, um, well, we, 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 we hit upon the subject of misemployment a lot when we get into that conversation, uh, me and Sean do, because, um, you know, a job guarantee is great, uh, but it doesn't guarantee you something that you want to wake up and, you know, that makes you feel good about getting out of the bed in the morning. You know, you can be guaranteed a task to do every day that you don't really enjoy. So I, it's kind of one of the reasons about, you know, leaving the bullshit job section out is that we didn't know how, whether or not that was going to muddy the waters with the debate on UBI, because some people really do just want to be able to survive and have the basic necessities taken care of, whether that be through any job they can get their hands on or um, through something like a, a, you know, welfare contribution. So it's kind of, it's a really difficult question when it's, again, that would be something that needs more attention. I don't think we could have a section on it. Uh, we find that with the future work and death, we find that with the cost of living, it's just, there's so many questions with regards to jobs and how, you know, they, they play a part in our lives and, 
it's just it's so different for each individual that you would need to attack that from many different angles i think to do it justice i think that's 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 certainly uh fair to say i think it's it's perhaps another issue entirely and perhaps perhaps could sit alongside basic income what do you think barb i mean it's, it comes up a lot doesn't it in, in basic yeah income it does i mean it's much more of a thing in the states than it is here in the uk um where more, more people are talking about universal basic services uh as an adjunct to basic income than job guarantee um i you know i certainly i saw how the work various work programs i've been on you know it's not just that i was a welfare advisor i, I was also on welfare myself for about 15 years raising my son and um you know i mean the thing is you know so i saw a lot of work programs come and go that were that were done by the government and i think a key issue which the job get you know people who advocate on solely for job guarantee and not for you know but not basic income I think the key question that, that they have yet to answer is how will these jobs be be decided? You know, we saw with the work programs here, it was extremely corrupt. Um, the people who got the free workers uh, were, you know, by and large donors and whether that's to the Labour Party or to, to the Tories, it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, and, you know, and, yeah. and it, as Wayne said, I mean, you know, it doesn't really solve the problem. Of yeah, well, I I think one thing it kind of it puts in my mind when you talk about a job guarantee and something like a, a, a basic income, it kind of just starts to feel like a decentralized workhouse. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you're, you're promised uh, your basic necessities if you go and do a task every day that you wouldn't necessarily choose to do. It just kind of feels like we're regressing a little bit back to, I think you need autonomy and that's what universal basic income, basic services, which I'm really, uh, interested in exploring more. I think it should be discussed alongside basic income um, a lot more than it is. Um, I think that's way more useful to people. Uh, and their autonomy, uh, of course, is one of the biggest parts and what will help them achieve, you know, not just a job, but a, a, you know, a, a reason for getting up in the morning. Yeah. But also, I mean, I think just to make this short point, I mean, you know, we're going to have to have some kind of new economy after this crisis passes i mean you know it's not like things were great before before the corona crisis hit and what we've mm. seen is you know that the that the main jo that the jobs that we need don't doing are largely unpaid underpaid or insecure yeah. or all three okay so you know I, I basic income allows people to actually make those choices and i i was interested there was a question from a crofter in scotland you know, we usually are talking about about basic income in the in the metropolis, but actually, I think where it would really be the most use is is in place. You know, in 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 the countryside and and for farmers and people who actually supply our food. I think is is a, a key thing for me. Well, this is probably where the film falls a little bit short for some people is that there's not a whole lot of details and there's not much of an exploration into what a UBI could mean. Like, you know, hundred pound, five hundred pound. Where would this be? What you know? What regions would this be? Would it be relative to uh, the region, much like uh, you know, student loans are for people living in London versus people living in, you know, Scotland? Um, and that's that is really difficult to kind of get a handle on, because there's just there's it, there's such an array of different types of um, you know poverty trap prevention schemes. Um, it's difficult to explore with any specificity uh, of, of what a UBI actually is. I mean, we've certainly encountered the, the most common suggestion as being a thousand pound per month, but a lot of people kind of turn their nose up and say that's, that's either too much or too little. But, <laughs> I mean, we've, I think philosophically and symbolically, we've, I think we're in agreement, you know, there's, we, 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 we've, we've kind of sorted that. The idea is it, it speaks for itself, but um, yeah, I think it's just the, the details are left. There's just a few pieces. Yeah. Which, yeah. Go on, Wayne. Just going to say, which is one of the main, you know, points that Chris Golden um, brings up in the film. He was a late addition in terms of interviewees, uh, one of our later interviewees uh, that we got on uh, the film. And it was really good in the edit to have uh, that perspective to bounce off because he, like Ashwin Kumar did, he brought up the problem of, um, you know, attaching a basic level which basic income attempts to do a basic level of funding for your basic needs which 
when you start to look at the nuances uh, within the welfare state in, in terms of the different types of people that you have in there, like people with disability needs and, and such, they all have different levels of care that uh, translates into monetary, uh, you know, monetary needs uh, that they have. They all, they all need different amounts of money is what I'm trying to say. Um, and to, to say, it, it, you know, basic income comes along and tries to say, well, we're going to give you this amount. That wouldn't work for a lot of people. So it was a, an interesting point that I think needs to be brought up more that it really does need to be defined. It's about the fact that basic income at the minute really isn't defined. It's, there's so many different ideas and it's, uh, it's, conversations it's like going on. An interesting development in the film as well was when we got Chris involved, we thought, um, we, we really do need another critic uh, in this film because, I, I mean, I certainly think that nuance lends itself to uh, a credibility to an idea. I really do think that. And um, I don't know what it says about me and Wayne as individuals, but we're kind of flitting between being firebrands and sceptics to, to UBI. And we, we, it, just, it just seemed like a more kind of well-rounded and wholesome idea if, we, if, you, if you show people that are criticising with you know, often valid, maybe sometimes not valid uh, criticisms of the, the idea. I mean, um, yeah, it, it just... Yeah. Any, any, any idea benefits from a great conversation. Yeah, and good ideas and a good PR, you know, and... You know, we'll come on to the kind of PR, because I think some people have been asking a little bit about that in, in the chat, but I think you're right. I mean, basically, I think it'd be fair to say, I think Bob would agree that it's basic income or UBI is almost like a bit of an umbrella term. Uh, and, and there's lots of, and I think the film kind of alludes to that, that there are different ideas of, of what that, what the amount could be and, and, uh, and how it would work practically. There's perhaps, perhaps some people would like to, to post some of the examples of the modelling that's been done in the UK of, of what that would look like in, in the chat box or the Q&A, or we can send that round afterwards, because there are some practical examples about how that would look and, and, and answering some of those, those, you know, good questions that people like Chris raise in, in the film. I wondered though, we had a question because Barb mentioned, you know, this was obviously filmed before COVID. Um, Barb said that you were actually able to film her in person, which was a novelty at the moment. So mm -hmm. Gabriella asked like, um, how do you think your interviews would have gone if you had started recording after COVID? I guess ha has COVID you know, changed some of the, the assumptions in the film? Um, uh, and has it brought up more sympathy for, for, for universal non-conditional support, do you think? Um, and, and maybe some of those people being interviewed, they might have, might have given different answers. I think uh, for the, the Vox Pops when we're interviewing uh, the public, I certainly think that more, more of them would be more receptive to the idea. I and mean, would have perhaps um, known a little bit more about uh, basic income just because of uh, uh, the pandemic times. Um, so I, I think the, the answers would be a little bit different uh, from them, but from the, the advocates and the, the critics of basic income, I'm not sure how much it would have changed. I, I mean, can't imagine that much. Uh, you broke up a little bit there, so forgive me if I repeat anything that you said, because uh, I missed a little bit. But yeah, I think that um, one of the things that coronavirus has helped, uh, the coronavirus problem has helped, uh, to highlight is the fact that people don't have a huge amount to fall back on. Uh, it was virtually no time before, you know, a furlough scheme was needed. Uh, and then moments after that, the people who were um, self-employed, much of them that could still continue to work during the pandemic, um, they needed the support instantly. Businesses, huge businesses, they needed the support instantly. It just highlighted just how hand to mouth the economy kind of, um, and, you know how, how, it, how it operates on a hand-to-mouth kind of basis and I think that was uh, the success of the furlough scheme of what as well highlighted just how much we need that safety net and how um, in, in a society that's kind of based around capitalism you can't really you can't really fuel the fire you need to fuel the fire in, in some way in order to not have everything collapse around you and um, I just think it's really highlighted just how small of a cushion we had in, in the first place from the outset. And I think that's helpful to the argument of the UBI, a, a basic yeah. income. And, and briefly, Barbie, mean, just to kind of hi you know, highlight some of, you know, just the, the sheer change that COVID has, has made to, to the debate around think, basic income. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly some politicians who've, who've become more convinced about it than they certainly were before. Um, 
I would say also that the, the fact that we'd made this massive push for an emergency based income the week before lockdown meant that that so, you know some self employed people did get some money. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, though, that there were 3 million that have been left out of any scheme um, have not been able to claim UC or you know, and I have had to live on savings or the, the kindness of family and friends, maybe not strangers, hopefully, um, you know, while what, you know, in these last nine months and, um, you know, that's still a problem. Uh, there's an emergency uh, basic income petition out uh, done by Organize, uh, which I'll, I'll put in the chat box in a minute. Uh, but, you know, it is still a problem and, the, you know, yeah. We'll, get, we'll definitely make sure people get those links at the end about and kind of what people can do next, including mm -hmm. signing petitions and things like that. Um, what one thing we had a question from Katrina and it's kind of been mentioned a little bit in, in the chat is, and I, I agree something that I took from, from the, the film was, um, I, I remember the, there was a, I think you were interviewing David Graeber and he said, um, uh, everyone thinks that they'd spend the money wisely, but that everyone else is a lazy bastard. Um, <laughs> and then you, you kind of use the, um, uh, that, that seemed to come up a lot in the interviews that you had with, you know, there was the guy at the takeaway counter, there was the lady in the craft shop. That seemed to be like a common response. And, and Katrina said that the feeling that some politicians believe that people with low incomes are somehow idle or undeserving and are therefore against uh, basic income. She asked, how, how do we change that feeling? Um, and, and how can we show that UBI can, you know, doesn't cause cause laziness? I know that was a, a little bit of a debate, but just share a little bit about that. Um, well, I was, was going to say, uh, in the pilots in, say, India, and uh, maybe it, it points to that being counterintuitive, that opinion of uh, people becoming lazy and just squandering it, that, that's actually counterintuitive, because uh, a lot of people um, become on, a bit more kind of entrepreneurial and they, they bet themselves in quite a short space of time. Um, I mean, uh, whether or not that would uh, translate uh, into, you know, into Western society, uh, I don't know, but I don't see any massive reasons uh, why it wouldn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, I I, on, I don't think, I'm not of the view that people would become lazy um, with, the, with the basic income. I think people would be more productive Overall, you'd have to suffer uh, some people who do just decide to take a, uh, to lie back and live the, the, as much of a good life they can live on a basic income, whatever the amount may be. Uh, but I think the more worrying thing uh, from a UBI in terms of uh, people's, is not people being lazy, but people being forced to, uh, to do nothing, people becoming useless, uh, people becoming supplicants of a, a much richer, uh, part of society uh, and basic income kind of Bob makes a really good uh, point in the film uh, with regards to the idea of basic income being just crumbs at the table she says that that's what you know what do you think wages are which is a really good point um, but that's what I I fear more is that not that people have become lazy is that they'll just become supplicants of this uh, handout and they won't really have much to do uh, ways to kind of participate in the economy and better their lives and you know uh, improve on their status and because Bob, we need kind of, that similar question to you but i mean that i suppose like in the film that as i said everyone kind of was like you know i i'm not i wouldn't i would work and i would be active but mm -hmm. there's a suspicious suspicion that other people wouldn't like how, how do we how do we counter that because you know that's something that we hear often isn't it is almost everyone would would be carrying on doing stuff but there's this uncertainty about what what we've somehow taught ourselves about other people yeah, well, we have the British music industry as a, as as a standard from the dole. I mean, you know, you talk about you talk to almost any musician between 1960 and 1995, and all of them were on the dole. All right. Now, how much? No, not all of them became famous. Okay, <laughs> but when you know when you have, and it's the same in the arts. It's you know. Um, and I think it could actually become like that in science as well, because a lot of science, you know, I sort of, I hear quite a lot of scientists complaining about how they have to be writing grants all the time and having to administer the grants. I, I really, I, I really do believe it would, it would mean a huge flowering and not people really, you know, not being supplicants so much as actually being able to take more control of their lives. Um, you know, I, you know, we have, we have Brian Eno on tape talking about being on, you know, 
being on welfare for the first you know year or so after art school to to do his music and look what we've got from it you know but there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people like that in this country you know who got their start either through welfare or through the enterprise allowance scheme which was a, a scheme in the 80s um you know where people set up on their own usually as freelance uh freelance musicians or photographers or artists um, and it really got their you know got them to it helped them get their start in, in what they wanted to do. And I think, you know, the pressure at the moment, you know, you have to get a job, you know, especially with the student loan scheme and all the other kinds of things, you know, the pressure really is to start working straight away before you really even know what, what you want to do. And maybe, um, maybe I'm kind of weird because I'm old enough to remember all of that. But I mean, the thing is, you know, there's so much that can be done and that people have been doing, you know, when they've got the, when they've, when they've got some money. Um, I wanted to, to shift to a question from uh, from Rebecca, and again, a couple of people have been alluding to this. I think that I think um, you, you I think you suggested in the film really that that perhaps the biggest barrier at the moment um, now is that is the political will to make this happen. I think mm -hmm. Guy Standing suggests that quite strongly in the film, um, and I seem to notice that the, the lady in the craft shop when when you asked her that question. It, about, you know, do you think it can happen? It was just a sigh. It was just like a exhale of breath, almost as if like you just couldn't see the government doing this. And so Rebecca's question is, like, well, how do we sell the concept to, of a basic income to the public? And um, it was raised a little bit at the end of the film. Um, you know, everyone agrees with the National Health Service, for example, could, could basic income be sold in, in those same terms? Uh, do you think, Sean and Wayne? Um, like I said earlier, I think, good ideas certainly good PR um, I suppose being an ideologue in these um, debates isn't helpful um, although it's difficult if you, I mean with an idea um, as, as good as UBI I realize that can be quite difficult not to be you know spearheading in it but like I said earlier I do think nuance lends itself to a certain credibility and um, we all have to be more open-minded to um, certain criticisms even if you heard them a hundred times before you know try not to build into your uh you know your your counter argument a clear disdain for the other person no matter how toweringly stupid they seem to be but I, I i really do think that um i just i just think that, that there needs to be more nuance and uh, people need to be less assertive i realize how i sound i know how i sound but uh yeah yeah i think um i think the idea maybe just needs taken apart more um, by more heads uh, and I think that um, maybe some of the uh, some of the ideas kind of um, most marketable aspects like the fact that everybody receives it maybe needs to be uh, looked at because that is going to be personally I, I've always wondered whether that's going to be uh, harder for the public to swallow that you have money building up in bank accounts that don't necessarily need it whether there's a way to make it really easy to switch on and off when you do need it uh, I don't know it's for smarter people to, than me to figure out but um, that's I think there's just many points to uh, basic income uh, the basic income arguments that really does need to be um, uh, defined and I think that alongside the concepts of basic um, services um, I think it can really find its, um, its its place in terms of bringing people to the table um, because we're, we're a country especially in the UK that you know we love the NHS uh, more than anything in, in, you know in our political system the NHS is, is held in a higher regard than most things uh, so we're not completely against the idea of having something um, that is available to everybody. I just think like the NHS, it's there when you need it, I think, and you know, but other basic services like education could be um, as opposed to being um, something that is charged for, especially in higher education. I think that UBI spoke about alongside those um, subjects and maybe take, you know, giving a little bit um, giving a little bit and not kind of trying to stick to uh, its, its current form might allow it to find its, its, uh, its place in the public's 
uh, mind is an acceptable idea. That's interesting. So it's a bit of a kind of flexibility around, around not just the, you know, how you sell it, but also you know, perhaps some compromise maybe about what, what, what it looks like exactly. But Barbie, was quite, um, uh, you know, Steve, Stephen uh, Hesketh in the chat there, sorry, people have been coining this phrase that, you know, that, that UBI, this is, can be our generation's NHS. That's obviously one way of, a powerful way of, of describing it. Is that, is that a kind of powerful, useful frame for you? And, and it, or, or there are some others as well. Um, well, I would call it our fair share, all right, because, um, you know, we want the services and we want the money and we're coming to get it, basically. Right? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's hard in the, at the moment, you know, because none of us can actually meet in, you know, meet outside or, or pre you know, we we did have the protests over the summer, but I don't know, you know, how those those are going to go after, you know, when once things kind of lift a little bit, maybe there will be. Um, I think what people really have to bear, you know, the whole cost question, I think people really have to bear in mind that, uh, you know, how much poverty actually costs the rest of society and um, what it, you know, what it will mean for everybody to have, you know, at least some level of, of, of subsistence, you know, it might not be quite enough to live on at first, I think we need to fight for more for sure. Um, but, you know, again, I think, you know, when I, when I talk to people on the street about it, um, it's usually, you know, the way I'm talking about it is like, well, do you feel you are really getting back from the economy what you put in? And usually mm -hmm. the answer is no, you know? So I think we really have to talk about this as a kind of, you know, kind of social dividend or something which is, you know, actually everybody's right. That's, we, want, that's one of my favorite ways of looking at it as a, as a social dividend or a, a citizen stipend. I, I think that's a, a much, uh, first of all, I, I haven't really liked the universal part of UBI, I much prefer unconditional. But can I just ask, I'm, I think I'm speaking for Wayne as well. Uh, Barb, Michael, what, what do you think for you, what is a good monthly basic income? Do you have a preference? Barb, what do you think? Well, I would go for the thousand pounds a month, to be right. honest. I think that would, you know, that's that that would cover most needs and you know would really reduce what we need to means test people for for sure you know we're already I, seeing loads of people coming and moving out of london because they don't see it's worth mm. it so yeah i think uh, i think definitely uh, in terms of having this you know come to fruition i think you need barb's attitude you know we're coming to get it as opposed to um trying to uh you know, ask for something like a basic income. I think I became more um, more aware of the fact that the public, uh, you know, winning the hearts and minds of the public was one of the biggest problems with uh, implementing a basic income after the, the latest elections, because that really did just show uh, a shift in the mindset uh, that not a huge amount of people expected uh, in the UK. And that kind of disheartened me. And I think that's not long after that is when we did uh, the interview with the lady in the uh, in the shop that you keep mentioning, Michael, um, because she was clearly disheartened, you know, as a Labour supporter after those elections. And some of the conversations we were having with the guys in the box pops, they all seem to have this, you know, amongst the a lot of the people that we talked to outside of this for a bit of research as well, they all seem to have this kind of, uh, opposition to a free lunch and people getting something for nothing uh, that's kind of just been bred into them I don't think they understand uh, enough that you know so much is taken from them for without them realizing I think if, if anything I think we need to educate people just how much they're giving away for free I think good documentaries like the social dilemma are doing that with regards to their data but I think even more so, I think we need to look at it in a historical context and look at the, the Industrial Revolution, just how much was taken out of certain towns. And then that town was just left to die. You know, uh, Middlesbrough, I think, is one of the ones that comes up a lot. Uh, you know, wealth was just extracted and extracted. And a, a big one now uh, that is coming up more in, in, in conversation is, is land in the UK. People are... are you know, they're pouring all this, um, people are getting rich and then they're buying more land. They're investing in something that doesn't move, doesn't benefit the rest of the economy. It just sits there generating wealth. And that is growing inequality. And it's just snowballing because the more inequality you have, the bigger problems you have. So I think, uh, yeah, it's just, things are just kind of, uh, I think people need educating on just how much 
they they should be getting from society that they're missing out on. Uh, and that, yes, a basic income isn't really a huge amount to ask. It's only partially what we should be asking for. Mm-hmm. Education is, is, for me, arguably just as important up there um, with a basic income because I, I look around my town, I'm from Bolton, and that is one place, uh, one thing I see failing most of the people in this town is a decent education system mm. and opportunity for a decent education. Absolutely. And I think you, you raised there, Wayne, a, a little bit about things like the, the, the issue around data, which you mentioned the film on Netflix, Social Dilemma uh, uh, addresses, and also land um, uh, and kind of both kind of taxes around land and, and data offer potentially different ways of paying for yeah. basic income, which I think might mean that we can get to it, to the kind of figures that Barb is it, talking about. Because I think often, I think maybe in your film a little bit, was sometimes the question around cost gets very tracked in yeah. deb- debates around, uh, you know, what, around income taxes, basically, or personal allowances and, and things like that. And I think sometimes that confines our thinking a little bit about where uh, where the money actually is now and, and, ha- and, and as you say where people are losing it from and that's often we're giving it away for free so often we don't realize yeah well you know that that was one of the things that was so disheartening uh there's been moments during the pandemic that have really highlighted that we're still a, w- a way away from um figuring out how to implement these types of things george monbiot you know explained i don't think it made the cut but he explained a progressive tax in the past was used to uh, stop, uh, you know, wealth accumulation and power accumulation. Um, and you look at uh, during the pandemic, I think the UK tried to implement um, a tax on some of the US, uh, the big US companies uh, in tech, and they were shot down instantly by the US. The idea just completely lost, um, you know, lost any um, traction that it was gaining because the US said that, that we were singling out American companies. When really we were just trying to get the tax that was old that could have gone to you know helping certain costs with the pandemic but that they really easily turned around and decided to scrap the extra 20 pounds uh that they afforded to the universal credit claimants and you know there, there was no kind of uproar for either of those things and i think that that's what's missing uh mm-hmm. is that people just don't understand it enough what how, how they're being taken for a ride in in, in many different ways um, Barb, I wondered if you, because I know George John Byers talks a lot about land and reform. There's uh, David in the chat talks about the work being done in Scotland around this. And I don't know, there's been some chat on the uh, on the Zoom tonight about different ways of funding us. I don't know if you could just kind of shed some light on on, on some of the, just an overview of some of those different ways, perhaps that people could go away and research. Yeah, well, there's tons of stuff on the web. Um, Citizens, uh, the Citizens Basic Income Trust has a really good website with a lot of the research that's happened in the UK and notice of that. Um, there's also uh, schemes there. They're significantly less than a thousand pound a month, I have to say, but they were trying to make that, you know, the, the idea was to make it, rev- you know, so-called revenue neutral. So it wasn't going to cost, you know, much more than what the current system does. Uh, we have a newsletter which we put we publish regularly so you can sign that sign up for that on basicincome.org.uk uh, the ubi lab network uh, .org.uk um, has um, has been organizing in in localities uh, for the la- you know particularly intensely for the last sort of nine months um, and so i can't remember how many labs there are so you could certainly get in touch with them and find a lab in your in your area. Um, there have been several council motions, uh, more than several, uh, something like eight, 16 or 17 now. We're up to supporting basic income, but I think what people need to do is really get in touch with their councillors and, and push for them to actually fulfill those motions, whether that's in terms of writing to Rishi Sunak or also uh, maybe figuring out a way to do a pilot without getting primary legislation. You know, I'm very interested in the idea of local currencies for basic income. Uh, Korea has done this, so there have been parts of Korea that have tried trialed a, a basic income with a, a cash card, and I think that would have been a very easy way to get money directly to people anywhere. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. keep talking to Barbara, people. I'm going to cut you off, sorry, because it was sorry. short. On time. I've just seen the time. I didn't realize yeah. it's so close to uh, half past eight. So we're going to we're going to finish up here. I think what Barb, you know, outlined there is just so many different ways to 
to explore this and this is why it's such an interesting topic and I'm sure as I said earlier it could be could be a whole bunch of films around this but as I said I think Sean and Wayne have given us a fantastic overview of some of those main arguments and then certainly a good introduction and into some a bit more depth into some of those those debates and um, whether it's more pilots whether it's more work alongside other organizations whether it's you know, pushing politicians there's lots uh, for people to get involved with um, there's there's going to be a lot coming in the in the next uh, few weeks actually um, probably towards the end of February uh, there's going to be a, a big petition that's going to go into the Chancellor ahead of the, the budget uh, if you haven't already uh, please do um, sign a, a petition that will that be going into the chat uh, very shortly. Um, we're also get, at the Basic Income Conversation, we're going to be rolling out our, our, our conversation toolkit at the end of the month uh, and we'll have a new website and social media channels to share with you. So do keep your eyes peeled for that and um, if you're signed up to the mailing list you'll, you'll hear more about that and, and, and some follow-on from this evening. Uh, I suppose that's all it left for me to do is say a huge thank you to uh, Sean and Wayne for sharing your, your work with us. I think people in the chat have been saying how how fascinating the, and, and brilliant the film was itself and a big thanks to Barb as well for, for joining us um, and I should say one more time we're, we're delighted with so many of you that have joined and, and also donated already if you please do remember to to, uh, to donate to the basic income conversation if you can of course we understand it's difficult times at the moment the, the chats um, the, the link is in the chat there um, but as I said we'll be in touch very soon there'll be a recording of this um, uh, last thing I should say is, that ha Sean and, and Wayne, how can people, you know, tell their friends about this film? Uh, now, you know, where, where do people go and, and, and send the link to? It's the film's available on uh, Amazon Prime. Uh, it's also available via our website at www.gadflyproductions.co.uk, um, and uh, you can find it on uh, Vimeo. Again, it's via our website. I think website at the minute for anyone in the UK. Uh, I think that's the best place to find it, anyone in the UK and worldwide. In America, it's got its own funding uh, distribution deal. So I think if you go to First Run Features, if you're in the US, uh, their Vimeo On Demand should have it. Um, uh, right. Yeah. And if you can put that link in the chat, we'll also send it around afterwards. But um, that would be brilliant. So, so thank you, everyone, again. Um, uh, take care this evening. Uh, stay safe in these, you know, these challenging times, um, and uh, and have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.